Good evening. Uh, my name is David Rothkopf, and I will be your moderator for this evening in our uh, Carnegie Endowment discussion about um, how should the next American president engage the world. This is a debate format discussion. Uh, we have a terrific group of panelists here. Uh, starting on our far right here, we have Professor John Eikenberry of Princeton. Next to him is Tom Friedman of the New York Times. Next to him is our own Jessica Matthews of the Carnegie Endowment. And beside Jessica is Bob Kagan of the Brookings Institution. And we are going to cover several sets of issues in little blocks tonight. Uh, in each case, I'm going to open up. I'm going to uh, open the discussion with a quote from one or two of the panelists. We'll then have some interaction among the panelists on the theme of the quote. Uh, and then I'll ask them a couple of questions about related issues. Following that, at the end of each one of these sort of three 20 or 25 minute sections, I'm going to look to you for questions. So we can keep this as interactive as possible and have you as engaged in the discussion um, as, as possible. At the very end, there'll even be a little more time so that if we haven't covered something in the context of these three big themes, uh, then you'll be able to introduce that into the discussion, and we will wrap up here promptly at 8 o'clock tonight. Uh, when we do get to the questions and answers, it would be good if you would identify yourselves uh, and keep your statement uh, in the form of a question rather than an oration. I've already spoken to them about this same uh, goal, which is to have a lot of kind of brief uh, comments and engagement uh, uh, on, on each of the issues. Uh, we're going to start as our first issue on the theme of American decline. Uh, Bob famously wrote here, and those of you in the first three rows can read this. I think those of you in the very back, uh, it will appear something like an eye test, uh, but I will read it for you. Uh, Bob wrote, um, or actually said in an interview, the United States, both economically and militarily, and also in terms of its overall influence, uh, really is as strong as it's ever been. Uh, he said this on February 21st, 2012, in case you want to pinpoint uh, at least that statement of our strength. Um, Tom, do you agree with the assertion that right now or in 2012, the United States is as strong as we've ever been? Well, it depends, David, if you're speaking about strong relative to what and to whom. Um, uh, the way I, and, and, I, and in what area, uh, I think there's no question in terms of influence. Um, and uh, on the global stage, we're, uh, I think, the country that is still most emulated in the world. But it is possible to be, as uh, Mohammed Alarian said, um, uh, the world's cleanest dirty shirt also. Um, that, uh, and so I, I really prefer to think about American strength. I, I have to answer this question in a little bit of detail. Um, in terms of what are the things that um, have made us strong historically? And I would argue um, that uh, we actually had a formula for success in this country, um, and it was built on five pillars. Uh, one was educate our people up to and beyond whatever the technology was, so they could get the most out of it. So when it was the cotton gin, it was universal primary education. When it was the factory, it was universal secondary education. And when it was the laptop, it was universal post-secondary education, or to the extent that we could do that. Second, we had the world's best infrastructure, roads, airports, telecom, bandwidth, et cetera, to get the most out of it. Third, we had the world's most open in this century, half century, of immigration policy to attract the most energetic and talented immigrants from around the world to start 40% of the new companies in Silicon Valley. Uh, fourth, we had the best rules for capital formation to prevent recklessness and incentivize risk taking. And lastly, we had the most government funded research um, to push out the boundaries of science and technology so our best innovators and entrepreneurs could pluck them and start these new companies. So if you think about that as our formula for success, where are we today? On education, we now, um, uh, well, Roughly 30% of high school students drop out of high school. Um, we used to lead the world in college graduates coming out of high school. We no longer do that. Um, on infrastructure, um, uh, according to the American Society of Civil Engineers, we're now $2 trillion in deficit in terms of infrastructure. Immigration, we have a policy now that basically says, come here, get a great education, and then get the hell out of our country. Um, 
uh, we're, we're fighting on the simplest H-1B issues that are so vital for our future strength. Fourth, uh, the right rules for incentivizing risk-taking and preventing recklessness. How did you like that subprime crisis? And I don't think we've in any way remedied it to the degree we want. And on government-funded research, if you've seen that graph, it looks like an EKG heading for a heart attack. So um, I don't know, it's kind of relative to what, all I know is in terms of the things that have historically made us great, um, uh, on each one of those indices, I see us not going in the direction we should be going. And for me, that's the alarm bell and the wake-up call and the pep talk that you know, I've been trying to put forth in, in my own writing. OK, well, Jessica, let me ask the same question to you. Are we as strong as we've ever been? Or are there ways that you see measurable and meaningful decline? I, I, to me, it's obvious that we're not as strong as we've ever been, both for the reasons that Tom has just uh, enumerated, but also because the world has changed around us, in part because that was our policy. I mean, we spent an awful lot of time, effort, and money after World War II, creating an international system, economic system in particular, to stimulate growth in the rest of the world. So this is the success of a policy of several decades that has made us relatively less strong in terms of just disposable cash and disposable um, incentive to, to get um, uh, the behavior that we want to see. Um, militarily, we surely are as strong as we have ever been, but we live in a world that now has um, a number of nuclear powers, and we used to live in a world pre-1957 that had none, so, uh, other than us. So, I, you know, I, to me, it, it hardly even seems worth debating that this is a, this is a different world. Well, I was told we had to debate it. Well, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to keep. I'm going to keep. I'm going to keep going down the line and see if I'm you find anybody going. who's yeah, right, willing yeah, yeah. to debate it. That's, yeah. the, that's okay. the key thing. Well, John, I just debated I, I, it. I, I can't debate it either. I, I don't. I for me, decline is the wrong word. I think that the, the the world is getting more crowded. There are countries that are catching up, that are growing faster, and in economic terms, uh, the U.S. will have uh, less share of world wealth and GNP in the years ahead. But there isn't a country, and by the way, that is, as Jessica said, that's a story of, of American success. It's a story of American strength and success, not weakness and failure. It's, it's 60 years of promoting an open world system, rules, uh, a, a vision of integration, of, of, of trade. So it's, it's, it's what the architects of the 1940s would just be flabbergasted at how successful this order has been. So it, uh, if that's decline, it's built into the American vision. But uh, uh, there, I think uh, there is a, a story of transition, of power transition, and the United States is not going to be able to, to uh, wield a unipolar uh, authority as it has in the past, uh, if it ever really could. And so uh, new habits, new institutions, new bargains uh, with countries that are primarily coming up outside of the West and who are not present at the creation. So there's a lot of diplomacy ahead, but it is a story of taking advantage of, of great opportunities that were generated by uh, this US-led system. So um, we have not so much, no way. It's not that simple. And you have the opportunity to argue with any of them or with yourself, because this was in February and by <laughs> yeah, now. Yeah, I know. I mean, what am I supposed to keep, <laughs> feel the same way six months later? How many months later? Yeah. No, I, I, there, there's always two problems with this discussion, and one is a tendency to overestimate our power in the past and have a very rosy view of how wonderful everything used to be. I mean, um, Tom has picked out several areas where, you know, you could say that we're measurably worse off. I could pick out a bunch of areas where we're measurably better off. I mean, you know, Tom writes in, in his great book, That Used to Be Us, uh, segregation also used to be us. Um, you know, uh, denying uh, massive amounts of people their rights used to be us. Not being concerned about po the poor used to be us. And so um, I would say, looking historically, there have been periods when we've been on various different measures better than we are now. There have also been measures when we've been worse than we are now. So it's a mixed picture is what I would say. But the real question I think we're addressing, it's, I shouldn't say the real question, because I think all the things that Tom talks about are important. And I'm, and I'm all for the pep talk. I, I agree with the pep talk. Um, but in terms of measuring our influence, I, again, I think then I, I, I jump on the phrase that John had, which is when he said, we don't exercise unipolar authority if we ever actually did. And I think the answer is, of course, we never actually did. 
Um, we, we spent the Cold War dealing with the Soviet Union that uh, wielded a certain amount of influence, had troops to control half of Europe. Um, I think our situation is un unquestionably better now uh, than it was during that period in terms of, um, in terms of our strategic situation, in terms of, of wielding overall influence. And, and I think the real way to look at this, and John also uh, talked about that, is when I measure American success and American influence, I, I measure it against the capacity to uphold a certain kind of world order, which the United States uh, has upheld for, for many decades since the end of the Second World War. Uh, and a lot of the changes that people focus on, in my view, don't affect that world order in a negative way. And this is the point that Jessica made. The rise of Brazil, the rise of India, um, just like the rise of Germany and Japan, are not, don't count against uh, that world order and therefore don't count against the United States and its ability to influence things. Our goal, yes, is to, is to create a world order where we don't have to have uh, necessarily as much uh, effort in terms of getting other people to do things. Uh, but the, the problem we face right now is, of course, there are uh, those challenges. But even as I look at those challenges, countries like China and Russia, which don't really share our goal for a global order, I still have a hard time wishing I were back in the good old days of the Soviet Union. So uh, I think that on balance, in terms of our ability to keep shaping the order, I mentioned, I'm going to end on this other point, that the one thing is to overestimate how wonderful things were in the past. The other is to underestimate how terrible things are now. Uh, we're in the depths of a long recession. That's a time to be depressed. I understand that. Presumably we'll get out of that depression. I think we tend to underestimate our capabilities uh, and underachieve, actually, in the international system. I think we have a lot more more influence than actually we're even exercising. Okay, well let's let's talk about that issue, that issue of influence. The United States has just come out of a couple of wars in the Middle East where we spent two or three trillion dollars. There doesn't seem to be a lot of political will to re-engage, so that's a limiter on our influence. Uh, we're broke as a country. That's a limiter on our influence and our ability to spend. We're going to have to start spending less one way or another. So that's a limiter. Some of the international institutions that we've worked within before are facing other challenges. Our European allies are certainly inward looking because they've got certain problems. The Japanese have certain problems and so forth. So that limits them. Uh, while NATO went outside its boundaries and started uh, uh, broadening its mandate by going into Afghanistan, uh, you even have today in the paper stories that they're leaving sooner, they're not happy with it, and so forth. And so in terms of our ability to project our force and the ability to project our influence, it seems like there's some strong headwinds at the very least. John, how do you think that's likely to manifest itself over the course of the next year? I mean, we're talking about the next American president. How do you think he combats this, or is he going to be capable of combating this perception of declining American influence? Well, I think one thing that has to happen is the, the next president needs to re-articulate the rationale for the United States to provide leadership, even if, under conditions where there are, are economic and other headwinds in, in, in front of the United States. Uh, that uh, the United States still is a critical player. It will have to be a kind of vision of internationalism that is uh, if you will, on the sly and on the cheap. That is to say, new ways that the United States can make a difference uh, uh, without necessarily uh, putting Marshall plans to work at er in every region of the world. Um, and then I think the other way to, to handle the headwinds uh, is to come back to one of the virtues at one of the successes or strengths of the American uh, approach to global order, and that is that it does have a, a capacity for various reasons to partner and build institutions and work with other states. The, the, the contrast with China is remarkable. The US has 55 or more uh, security partners of various sorts, from A to Z in terms of the, the, the nature of the commitment. China has one or two. The United States has somehow found it a kind of natural way to operate through international institutions, through partnerships, client states, uh, all sorts of different mechanisms that can generate cooperation. So in this next phase of American history, it seems like that's an asset that we should uh, seize upon. Uh, and to it's, some people call it burden sharing. Some people call it uh, 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 redistributing authority for global governance. But it's all there. And, and uh, it's part of leadership. Uh, and uh, in more demanding times, it seems like that is, uh, that is a strength the United States can rely on. Okay, well, Jessica, let's let's look at this in a constructive way rather than you know wringing our hands about decline or debating whether decline has taken place. Again, the next president takes office in January, uh, faces 
all the problems that Tom enumerated at home, plus fiscal cliff and tax Taxmageddon and dysfunctional Congress and all of this kind of thing. Are there concrete steps that this president can take as the country's principal foreign policy actor to reverse perceptions or to counter perceptions that the United States is in decline in terms of its global influence? Well, the most important one by far is attempting to heal the rifts domestically. I mean, we should have all, in, in answer to your first question, said what I think is the biggest change, more than the, the five areas Tom talked about, that weakens us, which is that we have never been, I think, as politically polarized and divided. We've never had as dysfunctional a Congress or as, as dysfunctional a relationship between uh, the two ends of Pennsylvania Avenue. So the biggest thing the president can do, and nicely he doesn't have to negotiate with any foreign partners to do it, um, is to get a, 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 a slide down the fiscal cliff that has a, a relatively soft landing at the bottom, um, and to uh, uh, attempt to go beyond that, I think, in... Um, in trying to, f I, I hesitate to say this because it seems so unlikely, but in trying to find some, um, some common ground uh, on, a, on a range of domestic issues, because that's the thing that will have the greatest influence abroad that the U.S. still has what it used to have, and uh, which doesn't look like it does now. Okay. Well, this is a heads up to you guys, because we're moving along at a clip. I've got two more questions for them, and then I'm going to turn to you, and I want to get one or two questions, or maybe three, in quickly from the audience before we go back into the next thing. And it'll be on this theme of American decline and American influence. So if you've got a question that's half-baked in your mind, you've got another seven minutes to bake it. Um, Tom, I think Jessica's assessment there makes a lot of sense, but it, it seemed infused with hope. Um, uh, uh, in the context of the political situation that we are likely to face in this country. Based on what you believe is possible in terms of 2013, what can the president do, if anything? Well, let me make it just a couple of points, um, David. One is that, uh, you know, I, I start from the position of, of uh, being uh, some of an American nationalist. I believe America plays a on balance, constructive role in the world. And that if we are weakened at home, your kids won't just grow up in a different America. They'll grow up in a fundamentally different world. That the global public goods that the United States provides, um, we're not perfect, we're so far from perfect, we can't see perfect, but we provide enormous amount of global public goods. Your kids will not just grow up in a different America. They'll grow up in a different world. And so that's why I've been focused on then what are the sources of our strengths and, and, um, and how we renew them. And as Jessica said, well, you actually can't renew those sources of strength without some kind of political compromise. Now, I would argue that we're, um, we're actually uh, two decisions, two big decisions, away from a melt up. Uh, uh, in the American economy. That if we did get a decision on a grand bargain with a kind of 10-year time frame of uh, how we would manage the cuts in spending and, um, uh, and tax increases and investments, because we need to do, do all three. We need to tax, we need to cut, and we need to invest in the sources of our strength. I think that would just have a huge effect. I think Americans today feel in many ways like children of two permanently divorcing parents. And I think it's like a pall on the country um, in, in a lot of ways. So I think that would be huge. And second, if we got a grand bargain on energy, how to exploit this bounty of natural gas in particular in an environmentally safe and sustainable way on a national basis. I think those two together would have a huge um, impact. So the question is, how close are we to that? And um, you know, I have a saying about the Middle East there that maybe applies to American politics, which is in the Middle East, all important politics happens the morning after the morning after. So um, I think there's Just a- when is that? Uh, well, the, and, and here I'm talking about the election. So, um, and I think here the question really is, I don't know how the election is gonna come out. I make no predictions. But I do ask myself, if, if Romney gets smashed, um, uh, if he gets smashed, um, would it, I, I happen to think the political problem in the country today is we have a center left party and we have a far right party. Um, that is a structural problem. We, we, the Republican Party has gone nuts, in my view. Um, they've been at war with it's mass... analytical judgment. Right. <laughs> That's a, you know. um, they've, been at, they've been simultaneously... It's psychoanalytical judgment. They've been, 
Um, they've been simultaneously at war with math and physics at the same time, okay? Um, uh, on the deficit, um, uh, it was that, you know, deficits don't matter. Biology. And, and, and um, yeah, and biology too, probably, some of them. Guy in Missouri, for sure. Um, so uh, the question to me is what happens the morning after the morning after this election if Romney loses? The morning after, they'll all say it was because he wasn't far right enough. I wonder if the morning after the morning after, though, there will be a lot of people who say, we have gone way too far to the right, and we need a different Republican Party. We need a center-right Republican Party, which I think the country desperately needs, because it needs to be a check on the left and the center-left, and it's the only way we're going to get big compromises on these big issues. Can I just add, I mean, the little history s suggests both Clinton and Reagan, the second term was the productive term, the big achievements. And uh, so... It's hard to know whether the Republican Party will, where they will portion yes. the blame if that happens. But the question is how they decide to spend the next four years. And, well, let's, and let's, I, I think it's very hard to tell. But there is some hope in, in looking back uh, at both Clinton and Reagan. OK, well, let's not presuppose. Reagan, who was also considered a far-right lunatic running a far-right Republican Party, by the way, at the time, by people like, you know, whoever the Tom Friedman equivalent was at that time. Maybe it was Tom Friedman. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, in fact, but in fact, he wasn't. Right. No. I mean, life is just a little bit more complicated, despite your careful um, analysis he, of he, the political he raised, situation. Uh, he actually yeah. raised taxes when we needed to. Um, well, he and did a lot of things, them. and yeah. I think, I, you know, that's why I think parties in opposition tend to be less responsible than parties in power. I think you'd probably agree with that. Yeah, but this and is a I difference say, of degree that's a difference say, in kind. Well, it's a difference say. of degree yeah. from your point of view, but yeah. I would say that, that I could think of times when the other party also behaved irresponsibly in opposition. And then and the question is, it seems to me, is if... If, Ob if Romney's elected, then you have the party that was, you know, that you think was irresponsible is now in a position where they actually have to govern, and we'll see what happens with that. And that genuinely tends to pull parties mm -hmm. more toward the center no matter what, when, whenever someone becomes president. And I think just the way the left is unhappy with Obama in many respects, because uh, it, so if you have a, then we'd see what happened to the Democratic opposition. If Obama wins the second term, that's going to be the interesting question. And um, I'm optimistic because my reading of history is different from Jessica's. We have absolutely been this partisan and this divided and this gridlocked uh, many times throughout our history. Uh, you know, in the 19th century, people were buried. It said Democrat and Republican on their tombstone. You know, the newspapers were Democratic papers and Republican newspapers. Um, you know, I know you all remember the tariff dispute very well, but, uh, you know, there was tremendous gridlock. It took decades to get out of it. And, and the way the American system works, it's almost designed to create this. I'm sorry, I wish I could say this was dysfunctionality, but I'm afraid the system is almost designed to create this. And just when you think that the kettle is about to blow, sometimes, although not all the times, we had a civil war because we couldn't solve these problems, uh, but, some, but, but often uh, there is a, a, a coming together. And I actually am optimistic uh, that we'll see uh, greater sanity in dealing with these issues in the, in the, well, in the let, years let, to come. Let, let me ask Can I say you one thing to, to follow up with that, which is I think there is, you know, we may also have had a very unusual period of a Cold War, which really pushed both parties to the center. And now that that, you know, has been loosened, basically, because of the end of the Cold War and the way we want it, um, that we may, this is the normal, as Bob said. I, I'm ready to, to uh, concede it's that. It's a normal. We just, yeah. we, we well, we just happened to grow, but, grow but a lot me, of us came of age during the Cold we've, War. We've, everybody has made an assumption here or tipped their hat to an assumption of, of one particular outcome in the election, which is the president gets reelected second term. Now, you mentioned briefly there was a possibility Romney might be elected. Let's just talk about that a second, um, theoretically. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the, if... <laughs> If, it's a good thing I'm here. You yeah, know? no, no, <laughs> it is, and I and, and I think and I think everybody agrees with that. But but um, in terms of this issue of American influence, do you think a President Romney would handle things, do things, and have an impact on American influence that was really different from what a President Obama would do? Well, I mean, un unfortunately for answering this question, my basic thesis is that there's a tremendous degree of continuity at all times between uh, presidents that we already saw, I would say, and Jessica and I have a running art discussion about this. I was going to say argument, but it's not. Disagreement? Disagreement, which disagreement. has begun, I think, probably around January 2009. 
But I would say that many people are, have been struck. Uh, even the New York Times writes about this, at the continuity between Obama and, and George W. Bush, for that matter. So uh, any president, in my view, only changes things you know, 10 degrees one way, 10 degrees the other. Um, there will be some issues. Obviously, you know, there's no question that, uh, that the Romney takes a different view on how to deal with Russia. Um, and you'll probably see a different policy toward Russia. On Iran, I think it's a harder call, for instance. And one thing we haven't spoken about, and I think it, um, maybe you were going to get to it eventually, is... Um, well, since, we're only 25 minutes into this. So. Well, okay. Uh, but I mean, you know, since I consider it to be a not unreasonable possibility, regardless of who is in the White House, that the United States might wind up, whether out of the desire or because it has no choice, engaging in a military action in Iran, I mean, what is that going to do? to all these consensus is about spending, about whether the American people are interested in foreign policy and the, even issues like the defense budget. And that's why it's, it's, it's issues like that and the ones that we don't even know about that make me wary of the, all these straight line projections we're making in the future based on where, what things look like right now. Any of you guys want to address that point? Which point? The I mean, point about he Iran. Well, he well, pick on any of his points. But I, I meant the point about Iran and the likelihood that we would actually enter into some kind of military action there, uh, regardless of who wins. I start. I see, right now, it's not clear to me. Question from the audience. <laughs> yes, sir. Front row. Microphone approaching you from the left. Governor Romney has said he wants to create 12 million jobs during his term, that's 250,000 jobs a month. In the past, the U.S. has always been an exporter, and that was what created jobs. How do you see his promise of creating 12 million jobs in four years? Unlikely. <laughs> okay, that's, that's one view, unlikely. Does anybody want to elaborate on that? or? Look, you know, I, I think we're in a completely different, um, uh, you know, job market. Um, we're, you know, I wrote about this myself a, a few weeks ago during the convention, which is, you know, Bill Clinton's line back in 1992 was, um, if you work hard and play by the rules, um, you should expect to be in the American middle class. I mean, that's a condensation of what he said, but that's basically what he's been saying. And Obama has repeated it. And um, I just don't think that's, uh, that is NA. I think that's no longer applicable. I think you have to work harder, study harder. Uh, learn and relearn faster, and maybe reinvent the rules. Um, and that is because we are in a in a very different work environment where technology is making uh, older jobs uh, outdated faster, and wonderfully spinning off new jobs. But each of those new jobs require more education. And so um, I, I just think that if we're going to, by the way, I think America has a huge advantage in this world uh, because it's. I, I think the world is really going to be divided going forward between high imagination enabling countries and low imagination enabling countries. And we are the highest imagination enabling country in the world. If you just have the spark of an idea now, if you just have the spark of an idea, you can go to Delta in Taiwan, they'll design this for you. You skip over to Hangzhou, Alibaba, they'll get you a cheap Chinese manufacturer for this. Jump over to Amazon.com, Jeff Bezos will do your fulfillment and delivery and gift wrap it for Christmas. Craigslist will get you an accountant and Freelancer.com will get you your logo. They're all commodities except this. And there's no country that does this better. The problem with this, though, is that um, the days where Ford will move to your town with 25,000 person factory are over. Okay, that factory is now 2,500 people, maybe, and a lot of robots. And you know the old joke, the modern factory, the future is going to be two employees, a man and a dog. The man is there to feed the dog, and the dog is there to keep the man away from the machines. Okay, <laughs> so that in that world, generating 12 million more jobs, you know, in whatever time frame he's talking about. Maybe it's possible, but it's only going to be possible if we once again get everyone starting something. And so what worries me about Romney is not that, I mean, he can make any projection you want. Obama can make any projection you want. But I think we really, really need to rethink the workplace, education, and how we become a truly startup Please nation again. Just oh. add something quick okay. to that. In the last 35 years, 80% of, of, of the households in this country have lost ground economically, 80%. And for almost all of them in that period went from one income to two income as women entered the workforce. That has a psychological effect that is just enormous. It doesn't really get 
confronted in this elect in this campaign yep. in those stark terms. But that's and I, I think that at least I would say the greatest strength of the American economy and of the American sort of culture has been that we have been the best at adapting to change, mm -hmm. at adapting to rapid change, at, at internalizing it and, and changing. I think this, this fact of three plus decades of having lost ground mm -hmm. economically makes people fear the future instead of embrace it. And when you fear the future, then, you, then that adaptability goes. And, and that's why I would say that uh, one of the big, big ways in which we have changed and which we are weaker than we have been. I've got oh, just one little uh, okay. uh, uh, final thought on that. I, uh, one thing that has surprised me in this last cycle of, of recession and great recession is that there hasn't been more talk of protectionism. And, and that gives me a little hope that, that uh, both parties realize that uh, the kind of 1930s solution to retraction of your economy uh, is really uh, worse than, than, than what you would otherwise do. And but isn't it true that you have a Republican candidate right now running on a very hard line against China and taking tough stand against China? It's actually a, a switch and that you actually have the Republican Party taking a tougher line on trade. Clinton Democrat. did too when he ran, and that's that's the pattern typically. Uh, and uh, there may be some specific uh, gravamen there that that need to be pursued, but the broader uh, political system is not uh, generating incentives for either political party to to use this as a big issue. And I think uh, that uh, that puts us in a position to to have a more uh, uh, forward looking uh, agenda of investment and uh, and. Uh, Looking at at these these things, Tom talks about the, the kinds of jobs in the twenty first century that is going to require adaptation to be able to acquire. Okay, we're gonna have one more quick question here, and I'll, I'll get to the back of the room ultimately. But we we'll have one more quick question here before we return to the cycle. Go ahead, sir. Briefly. Uh, Peter Shutley from Brookings. One of the key components of power, international power, is the perception of power, and there have been some recent polls, mainly Europe, mainly China that leaders in those countries perceive our power to be less. And when leaders and countries think our power is less, we have less power. So how does that relate to the point you made earlier? Bob. Well, the Chinese go through this cycle, and I don't blame them because we go through it ourselves, of deciding that the United States is finally in decline. They've made this strategic judgment maybe three times over the past 25 years, only to find themselves surprised. And, um, you know, there is, a, there is even a discussion within the Chinese strategic community. There are some people saying, you know, don't, don't get too carried away with this because the Americans don't go down uh, as easily as you may imagine. I, look, these perceptions are usually derived from an American self-perception. Uh, and, and, you know, if I were sitting outside the world and I saw what our economy was and I saw all the talk in the United States about how we're in decline, then I would come to that conclusion too. But what remains the case, and if you're not talking about the Chinese or Western Europeans, I still think, and this is more important than that, if you ask me what's important, uh, it is striking to me, whatever this perception may be, how many countries on the periphery of China, how many countries in the Persian Gulf and the Middle East, how many countries in Eastern Europe uh, and, around, uh, the, and around Russia are, continue to look to the United States uh, for strategic and other kinds of, of support. They have not decided that there's nothing, there's no one home there. Uh, we have seen over the past couple of years the countries of Southeast Asia, many of them, as not to mention Korea, Japan, India, Australia, turning to the United States as, as, they, as they raise their concerns about China. Uh, to me, that is a, that's voting with your feet, in a way. And it's more important than whatever these polls are saying. Well, yeah, but, I'd like to ask you a question to follow up on it. it Today I read in the paper that the Turkish government has just agreed to give a billion dollars to the Egyptian government. Um, and I thought this is a kind of an interesting twist in things because I, I think it's clear the Egyptians feel maybe the American money is not going to come and maybe there isn't the money and that's going to change our influence. In that part of the world, engagement is the proof or the disproof of the thesis that's involved here. You could have a situation next year or the year after or some point where Iran says, we have a nuclear weapon. And the United States hasn't gone in. The United States 
hasn't taken military action to stop it. Do you think that would be fundamentally and irreversibly damaging to the United States' perception of power and leadership in the world, just as not being able to write checks uh, is damaging to the perception of the role we once played? That one is just too hypothetical for me, uh -huh. Dave. I mean, seriously, I just, I mean, I, I, it, there's so many steps in there that I can't well, it's just quite one. think If, if the United me. States doesn't stop Iran from getting a nuclear weapon, does that send a message that we are incapable of, 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 of controlling outcomes in a way that some people think that we might have in the past through military action? Well, my own feeling is that um, I think there's a, still a, a reasonable chance that uh, a bargain will be struck with Iran. And so um, uh, I think it will require a credible threat of force. I don't think you'll get the Iranians' attention without that, and not from Israel, but from the United States. But I think that um, there is still uh, the possibility of a deal. And so I don't know what happens after. I, I mean, I, you know, I, again, I, I think that um, when I look at the world, I just came from China. Um, and uh, I think China's headed for a really difficult decade, you know. Um, I, mean, I was there when Xi Jinping disappeared. I like to not actually use the term China. I actually like to say one-fifth of humanity. The next president of one-fifth of humanity disappeared for two weeks, and nobody could even say he had a cold. Okay, that's unnerving. Okay, um, you know, what is China today? It's an authoritarian state with 500 million microbloggers, all right? So Xi Jinping, I think, is gonna to have to make the biggest political and economic reforms in China for the first time of any Chinese leader in a real two-way conversation with his people. And so I, 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 where, where Bob and I, I think disagrees is that I don't doubt at all that the world loves us, needs us, and wants us. Um, most of the world, more than ever. You open the American embassy visa line in any country in the world, and the, it'll stretch for miles. Um, my focus is simply making sure we're doing the right things that keep us there and can deliver on that promise. The great thing America has that China and Russia don't have is the power of emulation. They need transaction or bullying. We actually can lead through emulation. Let me take a shot at Iran. I don't yes. know how you did that segue. <laughs> <laughs> I just, it was clear he was going there. No matter what I, was, I was going there because I haven't figured out Iran yet, so you can ask somebody else. <laughs> uh, um, I think the, um, uh, I think the answer is that it depends how it happens and what the the surrounding context of a possible deal is. I think the president has made on it may be politically smart, but I think it's substantively a terrible mistake to say that containment is impossible and un unacceptable, uh, because I don't think it is, um, on, you know, in truth, right? Um, that means that there is, and there also, as we know from the discussion of all this, these silly red line discussions, um, there is quite possibly a, an Iranian nuclear capability that never becomes weaponized. Right, um, which probably the most likely outcome. Uh, so, and a deal could be embedded that accepts that in a potentially non-injured non-proliferation regime. I was about to say stronger, but it's probably not going to be stronger. But it could be non-injured. Um, and and in those conditions. The answer to your question, and, and the US would certainly have been the lead actor in making all that come together. So are we seen as um, inevitably weaker if Iran has a nuclear capability that is not weaponized? The answer is no. OK. Let's go to the next slide here that talks about the international order, because it's relevant to what Jessica uh, just said. Deftly, she provided us with a segue. We're talking about the liberal international order. We're talking about international institutions. John uh, has written, the most serious threat to American national security today 
is not a specific enemy, but the erosion of the institutional foundations of the global order that the United States has commanded for half a century. So he sees the institutions of the global order as being essential to our strength. Jessica has written, our fractured, gridlocked politics is having a major impact abroad on other countries' perceptions of US influence and power, and of course, on the desirability of the US example. Mm -hmm. Taking the first of these, Bob, and the, 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 the challenge that is posed to the US in terms of influence by the strength or lack of strength or current state of international institutions, what do you see out there that worries you in terms of the institutional structure in the world order right now? Well, John and I have a, I would say, subtle argument about this in the sense that my view is that uh, this is no place for subtle arguments. I know and I'm going to try to I'm going to try to move past it try to move past it as quickly as possible don't be subtle Bob. Uh, but but you know I have John believes these institutions can exist independent of American power ultimately if if they're set up correctly and I I doubt I believe they are generally a function of American power and and what I but I do worry and here's where I don't have a subtle disagreement with John I do worry about uh, the liberal world order uh, and whether the, 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 some of the things that uphold that order are in fact in a state of erosion. And I think one of the things that we may be looking at, which is sort of not the picture that anyone has really grappled with, is what if the United States is not in decline but the institutions of liberal order are? Uh, and you look around the world and you see the European Union, which I think will ultimately get out of it, by the way, but you could be very pessimistic about the future of the European Union. You could say that the UN Security Council has fallen back into a kind of paralysis. Um, you, could, uh, you could look at the international trading in environment and wonder about that. Um, to me, and this is the answer to your question, I think John and I would agree, uh, a world in which the United States is still strong, but all these institutions are eroding, is not a world I want to live in. And therefore, the United States really does have an interest uh, in trying its best to, to shore up these institutions. That's Would you like the, to subtly agree or disagree? No, that's the... I, Bob is coming my way. Uh, this is great. Uh, our, our, you have to our, ruin our, it, John, our, you know? Here's a... Uh, <laughs> um, just a, one, a couple quick points. Number one, my thesis is not that these institutions are independent. They are infused with power. They are instruments of power. They, they are used to signal limits on power. So power is never divorced from institutions. Uh, and in that regard, I argue that the US has been so brilliant on the world stage for half a century or longer because it has tied its power to these institutions that's bo both allowed it to make its power more durable and plenary and expansive, but also uh, making it more uh, uh, delimited and less based on indiscriminate arbitrary use of power in the more traditional sense. So uh, there is a, an argument about how institutions can allow for a powerful state to be, to be more influential by allowing it to signal its own restraint. Uh, the, the, the couple more points about this. The, my underlying argument about the liberal world order is that we are shifting from one that was organized around, if you will, the trilateral world. The U.S. with Germany and Japan as partners, a kind of trilateral system. Uh, in that sense, even when the United States was all-powerful, it had partners. But those partners were Western or they were tied to the United States in a very special way. The new array of powers are... Uh, more far-flung. The good news is that they, most of them are liberal, capitalist, and democratic. The U.S. accomplishment is partly an accomplishment about creating a world, spreading uh, a, a type of a political economy that, uh, that has become more, more global. The bad news is it has created a more uh, chaotic system in some sense. We've, we've succeeded all too well and that the governance institutions which were built for the trilateral world are not suited for this multipolar, multilateral world. And that means, as I said before, an agenda of new bargains with new states, uh, refurbishing institutions. The Europeans will have less authority, less voting. The United States will have to give way in, in various uh, 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 sites of, of, of authority, institutional authority. Uh, so. Uh, that is what I think is the, the, the future of renegotiating the liberal world order. But again, the, the fundamental point is that most of the countries rising up 
uh, are rising up precisely because they're in it. They want to be in it. The, the, the trade that comes from openness and the rules that provide rising states protections against precisely what we were talking about before, arbitrary and discriminate power. So uh, I think there are new constituencies for liberal order, but they, they have to be brought to the table and they have to be given uh, respect and, and the kind of level playing field that uh, you associate with liberal international order. Well, there, there, there are two dimensions to this that strike me as potentially worrisome, and I'd like to frame them, and then Jessica and Tom, I'd like you to respond to them, okay? On the one, we look at the panoply of international institutions, and, and, and we could have some cause for concern, right? We, global warming's an issue. The institutions that were created to deal with it have come up short thus far. Uh, international trade, uh, the WTO, certainly seems to have been overtaken by events in many respects and is not able to deal with these things. Clearly, in the context of NPT, we've got new problems in terms of nuclear proliferation that seem to be possibly beyond the reach of the mechanisms there. The United Nations Security Council has not been able to get its arms around Syria. We could go on. These institutions <clears throat> seem to be having problems. At the beginning of this administration, there's a lot of talk about the G20 as a mechanism for dealing with global economic crises. We seem to have drifted away from that 20 is too many. It's complicated. We do it on phone calls and back rooms the way that it was always done. So the institutions are weak. Then there's the component that you introduced in your, in your comment here in terms of the United States. And it's not just gridlocked politics. It's also referencing something Tom said. The United States had some power in these institutions because of the example it set and the principles that it had upheld. And after the financial crisis, the French and the Germans and the Chinese said, well, that's it for the US system. This is clearly a corrupt system, and they're not managing this system. And in terms of Obama came in and he said, well, I'm going to handle international things differently from my predecessor. I'm going to respect international law. And we've probably violated the sovereignty of more nations under Obama with drones and covert actions than we did under Bush. Uh, and so there's a whole new set of questions there. I could, the list could go on. It seems like we've got problems with the institutions, and we've got problems with our ability to lead within those institutions. And I was just wondering what your reaction was to one or both of those issues. Well, you know, I think there's two things I would say, David. One is a general statement, which is, um, at the point, you know, Bob has made, I, I agree with it. I mean, for ideas to win, you know, you know the, the power has to win. I mean, the Soviet Union's ideas were strong when the Soviet Union was strong. And our ideas of liberal internationalism, you know, will only be as strong as, as we can prove by example. In a world of social networks, though, I really go back to this, which is that emulation is, is hugely powerful force, you know, in this world. And that's why I'm so focused on America. I mean, the, you know, the, the whole argument in, in the book I did about energy and environment was that, look, if you can get 190 countries in the world to all agree um, on uh, verifiable limits on their carbon emissions, God bless you. But frankly, I never believed in that global institutional process. What I believed is make America, you know, the greenest country in the world. And so many more people will follow us voluntarily than we'll ever do on the basis of compulsion. So I've never actually spent, I can't say any time, very little time thinking about kind of these institutions. I think if, if we're strong, they will be strong. Um, and, our con and, our, and our sort of influence in them will be strong. Um, now there's a question of absolute strength and relative strength. As Jessica said earlier, look, India's a different country today, Brazil's a different country today, China's a different country today. Um, they are relative, you know, strength vis-a-vis -vis them is different economically. Um, I just worried about absolute, you know. I'm glad they're rising. It's a healthier world. It's a more stable world in, in, in many ways. So I'm just focused on one thing, our country. How do we, you know, get to where we need to be, realize our full potential? I think if, if we focus on that, everything else will fall into place. We got an awful lot up in the air I'd, um, here. I, I, uh, I mean, first it's worth saying that you know, in the aftermath of the end of the Cold War, we had a decade where we really pulled away from the international system rather dramatically. And we underestimated how willing the rest of the world was to act without us. And a whole number of rather meaningful things were done. The creation of the International Criminal Court, the Kyoto Treaty, um, uh, 
the, the landmine ban, any personnel landmine ban, the small arms agreement at the UN, all of them were done with the US voting against. And the votes were like 178 to one and uh, 146 with 18 abstentions, those kinds of votes. And the US was the only democracy with the exception of India and Israel in two cases that voted no. Um, and the, the, the countries that were voting with us were Iran, Iraq, Cuba, Libya. Kindred, um, kindred spirits. Yeah. Uh, so there is, a, there is a momentum in the system on a lot of issues that doesn't require us, but there is also on, on many cases, and climate is surely one of them, um, where, where we're the we're only the 600 pound gorilla now. China's the 800 pound one. It can't be, it, we can't be successful um, without us. I, um, I think this gets back to the discussion we had before about whether there's continuity or discontinuity. I think there's a profound discontinuity and likely to be also if Governor Romney's elected again in uh, the United States um, attitude towards international institutions, and in particular towards whether diplomacy can be problem solving. Um, you have to remember um, that the kind of, of rhetoric that came out of this country in the Bush years about Max Boot, um, that the US should unambiguously embrace its imperial role currently an advisor to Governor Romney. John Bolton, who said, and I wrote this one down so I don't misquote it, uh, it's a big mistake to grant any validity to international law, even when it may seem in our short-term interest to do so, because over the long term, the goal of those who think that international law means anything are those who want to constrain the US. This is our former ambassador to the this UN. This is our ambas <laughs> former ambassador to the UN and another advisor to Governor Romney in this. I say this not to, um, uh, you know, to criticize, not to make a partisan statement here, but to say it's different. It is different. Um, we spent years in the Bush years talking about an imperial role for the United States. Um, empire means you have a power who's above the rules, that makes rules for everybody else. That's just not what this world is, in my view. And it ain't ever going to work. And, and, uh, and so uh, um, I think with a United States that can solve its domestic problems and recapture a sense of it, that, it, um, that it is an example worth emulating, that there is, uh, although they are not nearly as strong as we'd like them to be. There is health and strength in the multinational system. You talk a lot about continuity. Um, at least you've talked about it a lot about it this evening. Um, if if you sort of set aside the past fifty years, the longest extended continuous strain in U.S. international outlook was isolationism. It was staying out of the world. It was looking after our own problems. It was taking advantage of the fact that the Atlantic and the Pacific immunized us against you know, being involved in issues on the other side of the world. Don't you worry that there is an impulse within the far right, and also to some degree within the far left in this country, to move in an isolationist direction, to move away from spending money and writing checks for international institutions, to move towards taking care of our own business in our own way. I mean, after all, here, look at President Obama and look at his strategy with regard to drones and covert operations and cyber attacks and so forth. It's very exceptionalist. Isn't this exceptionalist impulse something that could actually become more extreme in the, in the next several years? Well, I, I was with you right up until the end there because exceptionalism and isolationism are two different things. Uh, well, exceptionalism can also be the engine for quote unquote imperial foreign policy as well. And in fact, it's the sense that America is a, has a special role to play in the world. A view, by the way, that goes back to the founding of the nation 
that, that leads, in fact, to a tremendous amount of global activity. Well, I was, uh, I was seeing them both as linked by national narcissism. Well, let me, let me beat up on your, the first part of your premise, which is <laughs> that we were always an isolationist nation. I think that's, just, that's, that's the greatest myth. We tell ourselves this myth. Our myth is that we sit here minding our own business, and people do things to us, and we have to go deal with them. Or there are evil people who hijack our foreign policy and lead it off in in terrible directions. The truth is the United States was not an isolationist power. It was an expansive power. We started off as a strip of uh, poorly, inha lightly inhabited colonies along the coast of uh, the Atlantic and, and steadily for roughly 400 years expanded outward. So if you want to call that an isolationist nation, you know, I, I don't really think that's true. The fact is, and this is why I don't really worry about that, we had one clear isolationist period, and it was only isolationist with regard to Europe after World War I, and thankfully we learned a lesson of that. But we were also isolationist before World War I? No, we weren't. And before, sure Jessica. we were. I mean, we were we certainly had no desire to play a global role, and so we I had to be you bad. At least, at least you got. If you war. want to make this argument, you have to at least talk about the pre eighteen ninety eight period, right? No, no, that but was but your but first listen, in, terms, period. in terms of the semantics of it, I think we could get bogged down in this. I mean, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson talked about foreign entanglements. They didn't consider what happened on our continent to be foreign. So there's a bit of a difference between. But we were a commercial republic, and you know, we we basically we were expansive, and we have always been expansive. And the constant, oh, I've been hearing now. I mean, we've all been hearing every decade for the last three or four that America's about to head off into an isolationist phase. This isn't the first time we've, we, we, we talked about this. Uh, this was the concern right after the end of the Cold War, right? And in fact, many many people said, yeah, we don't need to be involved in the world as much as we were anymore. And the next thing you know, you've got Bill Clinton intervening in five different places, and then you've got September 11th, and, and then you're off to the races again. I think that there, the dynamic in American foreign policy is less, of course we are, we want to deal with our own problems now that we, you know, focused on our, our recession, but uh, you've already point, or someone's already pointed out, we're not becoming protectionist, we are not withdrawing from the world. Uh, uh, President Obama's talk about making more commitment to East Asia than we've had in the past, and I don't see any pushback on that in the United I States. I agree with that. I don't see it either. I think it's so overwhelmingly impossible that it's obvious to all Americans that and, you and can't even, do it. And I agree with that. The, the United States is, is still the most powerful country on earth, and there's no, I don't think I heard anything tonight that suggests that any other country, while the United, United States may have fewer material capabilities going forward relative to the aggregate of the world, that there is no one country that is likely to be a peer competitor or a replacement for the United States. The United States has this unique capacity, and it is therefore able to associate its interests with shaping the international environment. So it can uh, have a, a, a geopolitical space that is cross regions and allows the United States to pursue its interests uh, uh, in all these different ways. No, so a I purely think political a matter. The, you talk about the far right. The, the high point of Republican isolationism is when Pat Buchanan got whatever percentage of the vote he got in New Hampshire in 1992, and there has not been another person in the Republican Party, other, you know, I don't, President Ron Paul has not occurred yet. Even nominee Ron Paul hasn't occurred. And every single one of the candidates who were, you know, half crazy in five different ways, I know we're not on the record here. Um, <laughs> no, although you're they, on they TV, were not, right. They were not, <laughs> there was no isolationist serious candidate in the Republican Party. I think that's over for us. Okay. <laughs> Somebody have a question here? Way, way in the back. Is there a microphone in that? Last row there. Uh, Stephen Call, University of Maryland. Uh, is it important for the United States to abide by international law and the liberal international order? And is there a way that the United States could uh, use military force against Iran's uh, nuclear program without uh, UN approval and be in, in compliance with international law? Who wants to take that? You want to take it? Well, I'll take it, but I don't want to be droning on and on. I mean, well, I then just, speak uh, briefly. Right, I'll speak briefly. <laughs> the United States is, first of all, you know, uh, you can go through a lot of presidents going back to including Bill Clinton, obviously, who took military action uh, uh, in Kosovo in that case without a UN Security Council mandate. And every Barack Obama ran and says repeatedly that he does not consider the United States bound by to, to pursue its interests, bound by UN Security Council resolutions. And the funny 
I mean, America has a very ambivalent, I think it's fair to say ambivalent attitude toward international law. Um, we are in some respects the greatest spokesman sometimes for international law, but throughout our history and throughout the Cold War and even from the fact that we founded the United Nations, we have been uh, the, among the most persistent ignorers of international law at the same time. And so, you know, it, it's always this, and partly because we have this exceptional view that the laws are right for everybody, but they're not always right for us because we have a special role to play in the world. Isn't that yeah, a materially I, bad thing that is damaging to our status and to our credibility in the international community? Yeah, well, I, it seems to me if you, if you tried to say it in one sentence what the U.S. goal ought to be, it ought to be to create an, a world order uh, in, that we would like if we were not the most powerful country. Um, that's one that has law uh, rules. And um, the rule that's really relevant here is uh, preemption, which is recognized as a legitimate uh, causus belli in international law. What's not recognized is prevention. And the difference has to do with the imminence of the threat. If there were clear evidence um, that Iran was violating its, was, was weaponizing, uh, I think that there would be an international feeling that this was uh, a legitimate act of preemption. I, I, I have a feeling we would deeply regret it. But but I think it would, would have legitimacy, if not legality. But, uh, um, but if it were distant from the threat, and if the threat were uncertain or wrong, um, uh, then you have a whole different deal. One of, one of the many really terrible things about the Iraq War, which we were now, as a country, decided to sort of slip into oblivion, of, of trying to learn the lessons from it, uh, was that it was done on the basis of an entirely Ill, illegitimate uh, uh, legal basis, which was prevention. And, uh, and that is, is something that has no standing under international law, and which has been explicitly rejected by many of our great presidents, by Eisenhower, by Kennedy, by Lincoln. Uh, so, I, I mean, I think that is the is going to be the um, the deciding the deciding line. Okay. One more quick question from the back. By quick question, that means Tara should get to the back quickly. <laughs> Wherever, hand it to whomever has their hand extended. Um, hi, I'll try to ask this quickly then. <laughs> Uh, my name is Greg Sheckman. I'm with the University of Central Florida. And the question I have really is about um, global standing. You made the point, I guess, if we go back to Tom's EKG uh, reference about research and development going down a cliff. If we're looking at um, the dangers are always presented about hollowing out of the military, but really isn't it about hollowing out of our innovation capacity because our economic, environmental, national security is all predicated on our ability to innovate. So if we're not doing that, or we're not making those investments, aren't we telegraphing to the other nations that we're vulnerable? OK. We've got 25 minutes to go. I just want everybody to know that, and we've got another round of these. So Tom, do you want to take that? Yeah, I mean, this is a very important point. Uh, you know, I, I, all I can say is it, it's, um, you know, we, we, uh, we're, we're in an age where um, all net new jobs to the economy in the last, I don't know what period, five or 10 years, have uh, come from startups, um, new companies. And it's something that we are uniquely positioned uh, as a country to um, uh, promote. Um, and there's no secret how we, how we did it. Um, we uh, attracted the world's best minds. Um, we created the right uh, infrastructure, education, legal incentives. And, um, uh, and we pushed out the boundaries of um, biology and chemistry and, um, uh, and physics and math in, in ways that um, led to all these amazing new companies. I, I still think it will happen because I think uh, one of the great strengths of our country, it's so flexible that it's still full of people who, who just didn't get the word. 
Um, they didn't get the word that China's going to eat our breakfast, Germany's going to eat our lunch, and so they just go out and start stuff. And that's, that's the greatest thing about our country. But we need to be doing this at a scale now uh, because of the, the nature of work um, that I just don't think we, we've been to before. I was talking to a guy yesterday who was just finished with this point who, who was told me he's building a new hotel, and it was for one of the big chains that's going to kind of these low-end market hotels. And um, not, not low-end, but, you know, just more simple uh, kind of structures and operations. And I actually stayed in one. I stayed at the Hyatt at, at uh, Salt Lake City Airport this summer. And um, the theory of these hotels is the front desk is actually also the Starbucks and uh, the breakfast counter. Yeah. And the same person who checks you in gets you your coffee and gives you your Danish. And so that's just a simple, everyone is looking to do more things with fewer people. And therefore, instead of 25 thousand person factory, you know, we need 50 people creating jobs for 20, we need 20 creating jobs for 30, we need 30 creating jobs for 40. And I, I think it is going to require a really different approach to the economy, different set of incentives, laws, different approach to education. We kind of do man for, manpower development over here, and then we have education department here, and the two aren't connected. We have to completely merge them. So it, it, in an ideal world, that's what the election would be about. It would be sort of Romney's view of how you promote more startups versus Obama's. Um, it's not, but you know, sooner or later, that's where we're going to have to go to. All right, let's Thank go you. to the last group of questions here because it's salient to that. Uh, it talks about new actors and the rise of China. Um, it, you might also characterize it as the emergence of new competitors, new rivals, uh, both in terms of economics and power. Tom wrote, uh, in his last book, China is getting the most out of its authoritarianism. By contrast, we Americans are getting only 50% of the potential benefits from our first-rate democratic system. And John wrote, it may be possible for China to overtake the United States alone, but it is much less likely that China will ever manage to overtake the Western order. Um, I'd like to go to you, John, on that and then open this up. What do you mean by that? Well, I, I've always thought that the discussion of uh, U.S.-Chinese relations missed the fact that China is uh, not just facing the United States in a dyadic relationship, but is facing a larger system, which we've been talking about tonight, and that that larger system is huge, and it uh, it's, has liberal characteristics, it has realist uh, geopolitical characteristics, because it's filled with alliances as well, not just institutions of trade and so forth. And it's, it's uh, constituted of, uh, by, uh, by a, a, a world of, of uh, liberal democracies. Uh, and so China faces a much more formidable international order than any other rising state in world history has. If you think of a rising state looking up, past rising states over the modern era have faced one military state or several, but not a kind of thick global system that is, in effect, the OECD world. And so I think China is not going to be able to do to the world what uh, the United States had the opportunity to do uh, in the 20th century several times, which is to say, uh, really recreate international order. Uh, it also helps that the United States came to power in, uh, during the, uh, the, the nuclear era, where uh, there likely will not be a great power of war. And war in the past has always been that that uh, ingredient that has demolished the old order and paved the way for a rising state to do something new. China is not going to be able to play that game, uh, nor will China, I think, have the incentives to do that, because as we've suggested a little bit tonight, China is at least halfway in this order. It is a uh, United Nations Security Council permanent member. It's at the WTO. Uh, it is embedded even increasingly within a regional economy and, and regional institutions in Asia. So um, China faces an international order that's easy to join and very hard to overturn. And so I don't think we're going to have a repeat of what is the classic problem of world politics, the power transition problem, which of course was most dramatically revealed at the, uh, in the last century with, with the rise of Germany. So I, I think uh, the terms of rise and transition are different than in the past. All right, well, just can, can I ask him a question? Of course. I mean, it's, I mean, is it it's, personal or does it have no. to do with this? <laughs> I mean, usually rising powers also get a more expansive definition of their vital interests. Yes. So it may, the world order may be 
easy to join, but it also doesn't have a lot of empty space in it. That's and right, but it's important for China. China knows 2010 was a very important year for China to learn the lesson that uh, Bismarck learned, but those after Bismarck forgotten, uh, forgot in Germany, which is to say uh, it's the problem of self-encirclement. You push out, you have power, you, you have the kind of sense of entitlement to project influence into your region beyond your region, but other countries, small countries in Southeast Asia, but also Japan and Korea, uh, are, are not uh, inclined to play that game. They, they, they will resist. And in, in 2010 in Southeast Asia, at the Asian uh, uh, Regional Forum and uh, it, with relations with, with Japan and then later with Korea, in each of these three cases, those states around China responded in a way that we call balancing against or hedging against. And so the important the most important thing, uh, I think, to, to shape how China rises is to have China see that it's the pathway to a peaceful rise will take place within this order that the United States has helped build but, but no longer owns uh, as, a, as, the, as, the, as the simple state that, that has run this system. So the, China has reasons not to experience the problem of self-encirclement. And it, it is important for the United States and its allies to have mechanisms in place so that China, should it, should it choose to, want to signal restraint and accommodation, it will have the tools to do so. Well, one of the things that seems to actually be countervailing some of the trends we were talking about earlier, which is US decline and so forth, um, uh, is the fact that here is China, our biggest potential rival on the stage, and they seem really ambivalent about it. Early on in this administration, early on in the crisis, there was a lot of talk about a G2. The China said, please don't call it a G2. We don't want to be involved in that kind of a world. Uh, even though they, they played a role in the context of the climate talks, it was kind of like, well, we want to go slower than you. It's not necessarily uh, a leading role. And even though I think China was, for the first time, involved in a central role in a Mideast issue with regard to Iran, uh, one of the things that developments in the Middle East have, have demonstrated is that China doesn't want to get that involved. It doesn't want to play a hands-on role. In fact, they may not be ready for prime time. So we may be a little bit weaker, but in terms of all the other potential rivals, they're not doing so well either. I was just wondering. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, David. I, I think that um, uh, what, what strikes me about China, I, I was just there um, in this trip more than ever. Um, it's, it's so obvious, China is a really low trust society. Um, now, um, to be a low trust society in the age of innovation, that's like a really bad thing because trust is the key component to innovation. If I don't trust you, I can't share my ideas with you. If I don't trust you, won't, you'll steal them. If I don't trust my intellectual property, will be protected. And so I think this is just going to be a huge challenge for, for China going forward. I, 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 I I know, you know the history of rising powers and whatnot, but you know, this is a country that has to, is facing 300 million people moving from the countryside to the cities between now and 2030. That's the size of the United States. Um, and uh, I think that that challenge um, in, in this kind of uh, system where the leadership is gonna have to um, uh, have a two-way conversation with the people, I think it's gonna be all consuming. You want to hedge a little bit here and there. But I think the bigger point is, is this, what's framing it, is it's a very, I think something really important happened in the last decade. Um, you know, in, in 2004, I wrote a book called The World is Flat, arguing the world's getting connected. Okay, I wrote, the, when I wrote that book, Facebook didn't exist, Twitter didn't exist, LinkedIn didn't exist, Skype didn't exist. None of that existed, okay? So in, since then, We've gone, I think, from a connected to a hyper-connected world and from an interconnected world to a much more interdependent world. And to me, that's what's really shaping so much of the behavior in an interdependent world. And this is a point I made yesterday. First of all, your friends can kill you so much faster than your enemies. I mean, we have a mutual defense treaty with Greece. If they collapse or pull out of the European Union, everyone in this room is going to be affected. And your rivals falling can be as problematic as they're rising. If China's growth goes from 8% to 2%, we have a real problem. Um, uh, the whole world does. And so to me, and I think this whole move from connected to interconnected or hyperconnected, it all happened under the guise of the subprime crisis and post 9-11. So we, I don't think we fully absorbed it into 
So I'm not naive, I understand history, rising powers. I think China is gonna be so internally consumed um, uh, for the next 10 years. I'm not saying don't worry about them, but on the scale of things I do worry about, I worry much more about their collapse than their rise. But well, the, one of the best ways historically to take people's minds off bad problems at home yeah. is military adventures yeah. no, abroad. No question. Well, and, you know, I, and, and you know, as hyper-connected yeah. as thing, and, yeah. and of course you're right, um, a big part of that in, in China now is the growth of very virulent nationalism. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the tensions that are growing with Japan are, you know, I thought China had sort of learned its lesson in 2010 also, but it's come back. And so what we may be seeing are sort of early signs of, we have our, our, our national interests are bigger than they used to well, be. Well, and also, look, China, as Tom indicates, is facing a lot of big problems that may fuel that, right? By one estimate I saw, by 2016, the difference in Chinese wages and our wages is going to be seven cents or something like that an hour. Uh, China's buying the robots, too. They're not creating jobs as quickly as they would like to, so that's producing instability. And I wonder, Bob, you know, we tend to overstate things. We tend to view things too much in the context of the moment. We tend not to take as nuanced a view as we, we, we could. And I wonder if the problem with some of these big emerging powers isn't that they are so strong, but how weak they are and what problems they are likely to have. All of the BRICs right now are going through an economic problem. All of them face major political issues of one sort or another, with the possible exception of Brazil. All of them face um, uh, uh, inequality and gaps in their society. None of them are used to being big global players, with the exception of the Russians, and that was in a completely different context. So we've got sort of major powers that are also kind of toddlers. Um, in terms of being major powers and having real limitations. And I wonder how that should change our view or if you even agree with it. Well, I just want to take note of the American exceptionalist attitude that these other powers are toddlers, but that's a, you know, that's a typical American approach to these things. But look, Thank I, you. I think no, that's fine. Correct. I, just, I, felt, I felt the need <laughs> on, on behalf of the rest of the globe to uh, and, you know, and stick And they're up, delighted to finally have you their, speaking out. I know them. they are. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Look, the, the, the problem is, uh, oh, uh, first of all, I agree that these countries all have more problems than we were saying three years ago when it was obvious that the BRICs were going to take over and the United States was in decline. So, you know, shockingly enough, uh, they have had difficulties. But when you're talking about geopolitics, and here I agree with, with both points that, that Jessica made when you talk about, let's take China, for instance, you know, China is in a race between the most rational approach to what their current situation is and then maybe a less rational approach. There's a 21st century China, there's a 19th century China that thinks territory is what matters. You know, that who flies the flag over Taipei is what's important. You know, that is a 19th century attitude. And they have basic, classic attitudes towards the growth of their power. Uh, attributes which the United States exhibited at the end of the 19th century, attributes which Germany exhibited, which all powers have exhibited, which is exactly what Jessica says. We have more power. We want to be recognized for the more power that we have. Um, and so what our problem is, and it's not going to be easy to predict, is that there's a million reasons why China shouldn't be flexing muscles and shouldn't be getting into situations where the rest of the world is going to do exactly as John Eikenberry says. But look how many countries in the past have made that same error. You know, Norman Angel wrote this book in 1910 talking about how irrational it was for any of these great powers to go to war. Four now hours, he, four now years. he's pulling out his gun here. That's part of <laughs> Yeah, four years before the great powers all went to war. And so that's why I guess when I, when I think about the American role is we're not going to be able to predict the future. We should not be in a panic about China. But we do have to do what is possible to discourage them from taking the wrong course and encourage them from taking the right course, which is why... Basically, the consistent policy of this administration and many previous administrations has been right. There is an element of containment or hedging or what have you that says we will back up these countries if you, if you push too hard, but we also do welcome you into this international system under the terms that happen to be, you know, I hate telling other countries what's in their interest, but it happens to be in China's interest to rise precisely as the peaceful rise scenario suggests. You know, just to pick up on one point, which is that, uh, if you look at China's behavior toward Taiwan, because um, they're really the 
I, I think it's a real contrast how they're dealing with the islands now. I mean, for many years, the relationship to Taiwan was, marry me or I'll kill you. That was really China's policy, you know. And suddenly they just completely reversed that and went to a total embrace. Now, it, it's amazing. I mean, Taiwan, I mean, they basically absorbed Taiwan. And so I think there's a tension in China. You have one school that wants to bully and bluster. And, um, but we also saw them really reverse course too. So um, I think either one is is a possibility. Yeah, I think this is one area where I, I think the, the political parties, at the, the foreign policy operators in the two political parties mostly agree that we need to engage China and we also need to be providing counterweights and reassure our allies and creating uh, the kind of geopolitical space and weight in the region so that certain options are not available to, to China. So I think, but it does mean engaging China, uh, showing uh, China where a peaceful rise pathway might, might exist, uh, but, but hedge and, uh, and, and keep our allies uh, who, who want us there, but don't, and this is where both sides, China not wanting to j trigger self-encirclement, at least those who are most prudent, and on the American side, we have an incentive not to be too crusade-oriented because our allies in Southeast Asia don't want us to pursue a kind of old-style 19th century containment policy. So not too, not too hot, not too cold. It seems to me that on the American side, there is an incentive to, to be, uh, be, be, be uh, prudent and, and firm, but not, uh, but not uh, try to turn this into a new Cold War. And on the, the Chinese side, they clearly have a, an incentive to reassure their neighbors, uh, who are their trade partners, but who are all tied uh, to the United States for security. But I think it's worth adding, and I, I, I agree with everything that was just said, that there is a profound well of mistrust between the United States and China on sort of basic concepts and what we're after when we talk about arms control or what uh, interpreting the motive behind our actions and vice versa. And so in addition to not making them the enemy, we've got a, we've got a huge job, difficult job in trying to chip away at this mistrust and build a, a clearer foundation of where we understand each other when we um, interact. We've only got a couple of minutes. I want to pose one last question and get a quick answer from each one of you to the question. Seems to me that the candidate who wins presidential elections typically is the most optimistic candidate. It's a candidate who can portray a vision of the United States that is positive and plausible and that they know a way to get there. It's been very interesting to me watching this political campaign that it has been so negative and it has been so absent of clear, strong, positive views. What, one of the reasons this is particularly striking to me is that things aren't actually so bad. The United States is growing a little bit better than developing economies around the world. The BRICs are struggling. Other places are struggling. We've got some decent growth. We had a little bit better manufacturing numbers today than we had you know, a week ago. Uh, unemployment is falling a little bit. We've still got problems, but we've also got some amazing opportunities. One of the biggest geopolitical developments in terms of significance of the past decade is the new American energy paradigm and the fact that there is available here vast reserves of energy, that we're making breakthroughs also in terms of alternative energy, that energy independence or something akin to it or at least more energy independence is, is a possibility. In a world where high value added, super value added industries are key, the guy who protects intellectual property the most has an advantage. The place with the best schools and universities has an advantage. We are more stable. We have more capital. We have the formula to be the most successful nation in the world at this time and to not being talk about decline, but being talk about renaissance and resurgence. And yet, for some reason, this eludes us or this is you know, this is sort of brought up by candidates and it's drowned out by other things. And I just would like to quickly go down, each one of you has a minute, and I'd just like to get a sense of your reaction to this moment of promise for the United States. Bob. I mean, I'm the one who says we're not in decline and that things are really better than people think. And I think, I wish there were, there were more of that being said right now. But on the other hand, look, we're in a political campaign and, and nobody's supposed to say the other guy uh, isn't a disaster and won't turn it into a disaster. But I am generally 
uh, optimistic about the United States. I do think, A, we're going to come out of the recession, and B, I do think we are going to uh, fight our way through to a political uh, deal that deals with these all these range of economic issues that we have. Um, and I also think we continue to be in the most advantageous position. I wouldn't trade our position with any other country in the world. Jessica. I, there's none of the things you enumerated that I would disagree with, but... Um, but go ahead anyway. Uh, no, I think, that, you know, those are all true. Um, although you could say, you know, it's also true that college entry, SAT scores have gone down now for 40 years and the lowest this year um, ever, et cetera. Um, but here's, here's what really worries me. It, there is a longitudinal poll that asks people every two years, do you uh, believe the government in Washington does what is right most or all of the time? And when that question was first asked starting in 1958 uh, through the mid-60s, 75% of people said yes. And then there was an 18-year slide where it went from 75% to 25%. And it has stayed there in the region from 25 to 35 percent, 20 to 35 percent, ever since, through massive changes in ideology and in political leadership and in everything. That means that anybody under 40 uh, has lived their entire life in a country in which a majority of the citizens don't think the government in Washington is doing the right thing country got smarter. It's a, it's and, a well, this part is serious, I think. It is hard to imagine how you have a healthy democracy in those conditions. And I don't think we do have a healthy democracy right now. And I don't know how you, I mean, I have some ideas, but I don't know how you really turn that around. Um, and so, uh, and I think it's a whole different deal to have that as the kind of the the leader and shaper of the world international order than to have it as a 19th century country that didn't have much activity abroad. Uh, so um, I I uh, I think we um, we have a profound problem that uh, that I don't see signs yet of our being able to to find our way out of. Tom. So um, I think the first decade of the 21st century was one of the absolute worst in American history. Um, I am the guy who does believe, um, who does worry that we are in decline, um, who believes we have enormous potential, the world's set up for us, but um, I don't think you know, that we get to be exceptional um, without actually behaving exceptionally. And exceptionalism isn't an honorary doctorate you get that you get to wear for the rest of your life. And um, I believe in the first decade of the 21st century, and even bef beginning before that, we, were, we, were, we did just what our baseball players did. We substituted steroids for real muscle building. And those steroids were called getting people who didn't have the skills to build houses with hammers and nails um, and to inject massive credit into um, uh, the system uh, uh, for uh, a huge consumer binge. We are going to have to pay for that. And um, we have two candidates who aren't telling people the truth. They do not trust the people with the truth. And when candidates don't trust people with the truth, they don't trust them back. And it leaves them deeply anxious. And I think people are deeply anxious. So I keep asking who will tell the people. It's been my feeling from the beginning and the reason for a long time there, I was advocating a third party. Because I think we need to do three things at once. We need to cut spending. We have made promises to the next generation we cannot possibly keep. We need to raise revenue. We can't just take it out of spending because we also need to invest in the sources of our strength. And I believe from the very beginning that the candidate who would win is the one who would first come to the American people with a plan for economically healing the country, doing those three things at the scale of the problem. Please don't tell me it's not going to hurt and that we're going to get it all from rich people or we're going to get it all from spending. Number one, come to people with the truth. Here is the plan at the scale of the problem. Second, it's got to be fair. Everybody pays, some, rich pay more. They've had a great two decades, but everybody pays something. Three. And thirdly, a plan that was aspirational about making America great again. And what I found deeply disappointing about this campaign is I don't see either man 
talking about that three-part plan. John. When I think of the United States and the world today, I, I, I would probably agree with my colleagues here that uh, the domestic, getting the domestic house in order is the first, first issue. And I think of Pericles' uh, a comment uh, during the funeral oration as recorded by Thucydides when he said, I worry less about the strategies of my enemies than my own mistakes. And it, it seems to me that the United States and the world today is it, it, really up to itself to define what kind of 21st century it's going to have and whether it can get its house in order and do the sorts of things that entail cost cutting and investments and uh, finding a consensus on critical issues. But then, just ending on a more international note, looking out the next 20 years, it seems to me the great challenge for American foreign policy is to make sure that at the end of this next 20 year cycle, that, that this whole class of rising states that we've talked about tonight, non-Western developing countries, most of whom are in the global south, Brazil is a great example, India as well, that those countries rise up and find a home within this order that the United States has been so uh, vital in building and uh, managing for all these decades, that the worst outcome would be if China, a kind of unstable authoritarian uh, system, but nonetheless powerful, attracts these states into a, a geopolitical divide that leaves the United States on the other side. And so for me, the United States has in its power really, and certainly its ideas to imagine a, the next era of world politics, drawing on ideas that are American, ideas that go back to the progressive era, the New Deal, the Great Society, the US as, a, as an agent for modernization and, and progress, uh, international uh, developmentalism. Uh, it means the United States looking at these states, many of whom were uh, post-colonial, uh, countries with different political systems and traditions, but that nonetheless are liberal, capitalist, and democratic, and reimagine a coalition based on a new synthesis of these ideas. And that's all there for the taking, it seems to me. We in Washington and around the country right now are in the season of debates. Uh, there's going to be a debate on Wednesday. On the 22nd, there's a foreign policy debate. We have a vice presidential debate coming up. You're going to hear a lot of things in these debates. I don't think what you're going to hear is a discussion as thoughtful, as far-reaching, or as aspirational as this discussion has been. And I hope you'll join me in thanking this terrific panel for a great <laughs> Thank you. Vice versa.